are very faithful to us. To take your copy of the Word of God this morning and turn to the book of Romans chapter 1. We'll look at verses 15, 16 and 17. Thank Pastor Aaron for filling in for me last week. In my absence, I heard just great things about that service. See if we can follow up on it. Romans chapter 1. Tonight, we have a regular service at 7 o'clock, youth, young adults, children, following that a, a, a business meeting. Various things taking place uh, in that as well. Did I say what? A six o'clock service tonight. Don't pay attention to anything I say. Read it in the bulletin. All right. <laughs> when I start promoting Valentine's dinner as Christmas, you know we're in trouble. And that's what I did. Oh, mercy. Okay. Romans 1, 16 and, and 17. This morning, we're going to begin a, a series of sermons, messages that's going to take us on through Easter, the Lord willing through the ascension of Christ. And, uh, and what, what this is going to do is going to be a complete picture of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's going to basically take us through the Bible as we look at various events that took place. And these events make up the gospel of Christ. They, they, they can be considered God's eternal narrative, this complete message to us. And that's what we need. To, we need to get a hold of that complete message. And our theme text will be Romans chapter 1 verses 16 and 17, where Paul tells us that he is not ashamed, or the Greek, disappointed in the gospel of Jesus Christ, because what? It is the power of God unto salvation. God has the ability to get right into our hearts and our lives. It's the power of God unto salvation for all who actively believe. But a lot of people have a mental belief. Hasn't gone down into the heart yet. Where it's active. We need to activate that. And active, those who actively believe because they're in, going on the verse 17, is a righteousness of God or the faithful action of God revealed or unpacked in the gospel of Christ out of faith, into faith, just as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. So we have a vital foundation to lay this morning as we begin to look at this this narrative, and, and we're going to take it up to creation. And we're going to see it played out all through history and actually on into eternity. When you look at the whole issue of the gospel, you find that the gospel, as I've already said, is the eternal narrative of God, and it's worked out in the created order of time and space. In other words, God is still in control. Aren't you glad? Because you look at the news and read the paper, and you say, oh my goodness, we're, we're spinning out of control. Yes, man is spinning out of control, but God is still in control of all things. The gospel is not and can't be a product of the temporary order, but rather it is an evasion. It's an invasion from the eternal into the temporal, meaning that it didn't come with the birth of Christ. It's not just the, the, the 33 years of Christ on life. It's not just a Christ event. It is eternal. It was devised and agreed upon by the Trinity before what? The foundations of the world, this gospel story. I love the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not a product of temporal circumstance, and neither can it be regulated to, to just one event. Bottom line, the gospel is the entire record of God's involvement with you, with all of mankind. From creation all through to the end of time. You know what? It's all worked out. It's all worked out in time and history. So let's read our text this morning. Romans 1, 16 and 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first, also for the Greek. For in it, 
The righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. And we also look at Romans 8, 28 in just a little bit. Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you, Lord, for worship. Thank you, Lord, for moving around these altars. And Lord, we know that your word cleanses us. Lord, we receive nourishment that is vital to our sustenance daily. We receive it from your word. Lord, as important as food is to our bodies, how more important is thy word to us. So, Lord, as we look into it, Father, there is much truth, Lord, that needs to be revealed this morning. And so may our ears be ready to hear and our lives be ready to do what you have called us to do. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We're going to look at what the gospel is today. We're going to look at God's power. And we're going to look at its work in creation. The gospel. It is the power of God. or It is the intrinsic ability of God. God possesses this ability. God possesses this power because he is God. This power is a power of God. This power refers to the, and you ought to like this today, it refers to the, the personal ability of God to get right on the inside of your situation. How many times do we think our situation is worthless? Man, there is no hope. I am, I am in dire straits. I'm going to tell you something. God has a power to get right into that situation, working on the inside of that situation, any situation, for the purpose of bringing it about for eternal good and our eternal good at the same time. His good and our good. God has the ability to do that. How often do we want God to get on the inside of our situation and work it out for our good only? How often are we only concerned about me? Well, a couple other people, myself and I. Three of us. Split personality here. We want him to do it for our good. And we fail to see the eternal good or God's good in all of it. Some questions we want to answer, where, where do we see this happening? And, and where does it begin, God's involvement, in time or, or in eternity? If, if it begins in time, it's just one single event. I don't want God just working in one event of my life. I want him working throughout my entire life. And, and it, I don't want it just to be a temporary thing. I want it to be a, an eternal thing. We know that the gospel is an eternal gospel. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad it hasn't ended? Aren't you glad it didn't end before you got saved? God is concerned about your todays. The gospel is larger than the life of Christ or your life. It is larger than, than anything we can imagine. It's, it's, it goes from eternity past, so to speak, to eternity future. We can't even comprehend that. God is concerned about your todays. But he's more concerned as to how it affects the eternal. Not just for today, but for tomorrow and on through your life. See, God isn't preparing you today for tomorrow. God is working in your life and in the situations of your life to prepare you for an eternity with Him. That's what He's preparing you for. That's what He's preparing me for. When we look at the gospel, we must look further back than the life of Christ. We've got to go way back. That's point one, the gospel. Let's look at God's power, point number two. We're saying that is record time. Well, it's going to slow up. Okay. <laughs> What's the target of the gospel? The target of the gospel is your salvation. That's the target. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that's whosoever, and he wants your name in there, believes, will not perish, but have eternal life. Salvation through Jesus Christ has been provided for every person who has ever lived. Salvation. However, just because it's been provided for doesn't mean it has been, has, has been taken effect 
or has been effective. You see, it can only be effective for every person who actively believes the entire gospel. You need to believe what God has done, the eternal narrative of God. They must have their complete faith in who? Christ. You must have your complete faith in Christ. This is present salvation. It is currently being worked out as you have received. If you've received Christ today, you are, it's a guarantee to be completed at the end. Salvation. You see, as soon as you give your life to Christ, eternal life begins. As a believer, you are being led to the end by this very gospel of Christ. Now God, as I've said, is able to get straight into the inside of humanity's situations, of your situation, and turn it around for good. Has he ever done that for you? Or someone met ill, will, or tried to do something wrong? God is able to get right in the inside and flip that thing right around for whose benefit? His and yours. Romans 8, 28. Let's turn there and read that scripture. Likewise. No. And we know. And we know that I need new glasses. I can't, I can't read these numbers. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God. How many times do we quote that first part? We know that all things work together for good. Have you ever said that? When especially you're going through a bad man, I know all things work together for good. It doesn't end there. Because you see, all things don't work together for good for some people. All things, we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to whose purpose? His purpose. We like to put our purpose in there. Who are called according to my purpose. It doesn't work. You see, if it's all about you, then, then it's not all going to be worked out for good. Right? It's his purpose. His purpose. So how are those who love God known? We know that all things work together for good to those who love God. God. How do we know those who love God, how are they known? They are known because they are living their lives as if they have a calling on their life. And this calling has been placed in front of them from eternity. It is especially made to fit them, to fit you. God has a calling upon your life that no one else can do he created you for that calling, and that calling was fit for you. That's what he's saying here. This, this calling is not focused on one event. It's not focused on one teaching, but rather it's focused upon the whole. Your life is not one event, right? Aren't you glad? Because I can think of a lot of events that I don't want my life based on. My mind goes back to Back now in the good old days, don't you love that? The good old days. When I was a kid, I hated hearing that, the good old days. The good old days of outhouses? Yeah, right. Back in the good old days, when in school you didn't behave quite right, you got taken to the principal's office. Or just down the hall around the corner, and here comes the principal with a board, right? Anybody ever get the board in school? Am I the only one? Oh, thank the Lord, I'm not the only one. <laughs> Those are times you don't think it all works out together for good, but it, it, it does. It, <laughs> I'm glad my life is not on that one event. Mercy days. Your life is a complete picture that only God sees. You don't see tomorrow, right? We don't even see what lunch is going to look like. Lunch. We don't see that. God does. God sees the whole picture. So, don't get shook up when you have a bad day. 
Don't get shook up when you have a bad week. Oh. Don't get shook up when you have a bad month. Stop right there. Don't go any further. No need to go further. Don't get shook up even if you have a bad year. You ever have a bad year? Say, Man, I'm glad that year's over with. For some reason, January 1st just seems to be a refreshing day. Don't get all shook up because God's still in control. God sees the whole picture, and he leads us through this life for what? For eternal good. For when we're going to be with him. We don't have to understand it all. He doesn't tell us to understand it all. We just need to trust him through it all. God is still in control, and he still has a power to work it out for your eternal well-being. Don't interrupt what God is doing. Oh, how many times have we done that? We put our hands in the mix. Oh, we just mess it all up. This calling understands that the parts fit into the whole picture and within the right alignment. However, not everyone selects this calling. It is to those good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. Not everyone selects that calling. Not everyone selects God's purpose. The majority of mankind selects their own purpose, their own will, their own desire. The ones who select God's, the ones who construct their lives around the Lord Jesus Christ, they are the ones who love God, and, and that results in what? Salvation. Do you love the Lord this morning? Do you really love the Lord this morning? Do you love him through the good times? Do you love him through the bad times? Amen. I have to love him through all things. We read in our, our original text back in Romans 1 of the righteousness of God. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed. The word righteousness does not refer to flawless perfection. None of us are perfect. Well, almost none of us. No, none of us are perfect. <laughs> As righteousness applies to God, it refers to God's faithfulness to his covenant and his promise. Because God is faithful to his covenant, to his word, to his promise, God is right. God is righteous and vice versa. Because God is right and righteous, he will be what? Faithful to his promise, faithful to his covenant. You know what? That means I can stand on his promises. Because God is righteous. He is righteous. God has never acted out the wrong thing. But how many people believe that he has, you know? Why would God do that? God has never acted out the wrong thing. It's impossible for him to do that. He has always acted the right thing and in the right way and at the right time. Regardless of what we think about it, God is perfect. And he works it out right. He works it out right. And that is righteousness. That's what it refers to when it refers to God. Now, as righteousness applies to us, mankind, it refers to us in a right standing before God. And having, after having been placed in a right standing with God out of faith in Jesus Christ, we then have peace with God. Out of faith into faith is what he's telling us here. James tells us that. Paul alludes to it. And it runs throughout the entirety of the Word of God. From faith to faith. Out of faith into faith. You see, every situation in life is an opportunity to believe God. Every situation in your life, you have an opportunity to believe God or not believe God. Do you have an opportunity to put your faith in God or your faith in something else? Every opportunity, every situation, we have that opportunity. Think about that. How often do we not choose to believe God? How often do we choose to believe what? I think my way might be a little bit better. Not the, not the hammer tithing, but we often think that on tithing. If you don't tithe, you've made a choice to not believe God. You see, if you don't tithe, you don't have faith in God because you're not, you don't believe his word. 
And we can apply that to a lot of various things. How's come you're hitting my neck? It just came up. But, uh, if you got a problem with it, talk with the Lord. And, and he'll say the same thing I just told you. It's, it's going from faith to faith. Now, when you take a look at Abraham, what, what a great man. And each time this, this situation in life happens, and we stay, I'll get to Abraham in a minute, and we stay in the calling or in the, in the, the place where God puts us, this calling, in which God ha- he has gave us, instead of, instead of getting out of that calling and doing our own thing, when we get through this terrible situation, if we stay put, we're going to get through it okay. And it's going to be worked out for who's good. His good and your good. And a great example is Abraham. That's, that's going from faith to faith. Abraham, I think one of the last tests of his faith was to offer up his son Isaac on an altar that he built. Matter of fact, the poor kid, he was a teenager. Abraham even had him carry the wood up for his own, for his own altar. That'd be t- Man, if I was going to offer my son up as a sacrifice, I think at least I'd carry the wood up. I wouldn't want him to do anything. But Abraham did all of that. You know, and, and his first step was to leave his country, leave his family. You know what the first, the, the first test of faith would have been to offer up his son? That would have been impossible to do. But God built in Abraham these steps of faith. And that's what he's doing in us today. In a situation in your life, he's building up your faith. And if you, if you will believe God for it right now, he'll get you through it. If you choose not to believe, you know what's going to happen? You're going to go through it again. And if you choose not to believe, you know what's going to happen? You're going to go through it again. If you choose not to believe that time, you know what's going to happen? You're going to go through it again. I don't know about you, I get tired of going around over and over and over the same thing. Over and over. Lord, I want my faith to grow. Don't you want your faith to grow? If you want your faith to grow, he's going to take you from faith, out of faith, into faith. Out of that faith, into another faith, okay? You grow. And it happens in every situation in our life. We bump into things, as James tells us in the first chapter. And we see, as we bump into these various situations, I'll let, just give you a warning, you're going to have about a thousand of them this year. Don't count. <laughs> That's only three situations a day. You're going to bump into these various situations all the time. And we will see God's right action toward us and in our behalf. If what? If we remain where he has put us. See, we see this not just in our own lives, but we see it throughout the entire Bible in the lives of God's people from creation to today until the end. Those who come after us, should the Lord tarry. And to close this point, Paul is saying in our text that he is not ashamed, he's not not disappointed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not just the 33 years of Christ on this earth, but the entire narrative of God. He's not ashamed. he's, He's not disappointed that he went through shipwrecks. He's not disappointed that he was... He was beaten for his faith. He's not disappointed that he went through these things for Christ because what? It's a power of God unto salvation. All the way through. Until either the Lord takes you home or he comes again. Whichever comes first. So let's look at the third point. Creation. Let's go to John chapter 1. John 1 1. Great portion of Scripture. Kind of like the second layer of our foundation today. Next week we're going to get into the Garden of Eden, the flood, and various things from that. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. And the Word was with God, right? Or the Word was with God, the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. In eternity, the Word was, and that Word is Jesus Christ, 
and it was, or he was, face to face with God, and in fact, he was God. Now that answers the question to, as to what was in eternity pre-creation. You want to know what was in eternity pre-creation? God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things, all things that came, that exist actually, came to exist through the Word, through Jesus Christ. There is nothing that has ever come to exist without Christ. Nothing. For in Him, in Christ, is life. And the life was the light of men. We read it in the first five verses here. And the light was manifested. Manifested meaning what? That light was turned on all at once. Have you ever been in a real dark room and somebody hit the lights? Whoa, my stars! What is that? And it says here that the light was turned on all at once. It was manifested. Christ came on the scene and in the middle of that darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. It didn't have the ability to receive it with the intention of, of suppressing it because men like what? Darkness better than light. They wanted to suppress Christ when he came on the scene. Isn't that what happened? That's exactly what happened. They wanted to suppress them. Tuck it back on. Now, that, that's a universal truth. There is no entity, no person, no church, no ministry, no country, no government, no denomination, no large ministry of any sort that possesses the ability to receive any part of truth or light with the intention of making it their own revelation, as some do. Christ is not, Christ does not belong to, is, is it somebody's revelation? Is he? No. He's not owned by anyone. He doesn't belong to any group or any denomination. Some churches say, you've got to go to this church or you're not saved. Since when did you buy Christ? He doesn't belong to anybody. The light was manifested. In other words, the light came in his fullness. Peter tells us that after God spoke in times past, which are no longer, he spoke to us, through his son, Jesus Christ, who was appointed heir of all things, through whom God created, in all, created all things, and who now sits at the Father's right hand. There is an eternal existence of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. Now look at God in eternity. God is, is, a, is a perfect, unified entity of three co-equal, eternal personalities. What? God is a perfect, unified entity of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And that they have, it's a corporate one with three functions. And this corporate one is holy. And oh, how man, especially today, wants to de-holonize, that's a word, God. Right? We want to bring God down to our level, and he's no longer holy. We can't do that. God refuses to have that done to him. There is a standard. God is holy. And holy is, is not just another attribute of God. Rather, it is the sum total of all that God is. It is all of his attributes. It is all of his qualities. It's all of his nature, etc., put together in one. Holy. God is holy. Peter tells us God is holy, and as he is holy, so we are to be holy. So look, there's two sides of that holiness thing. Number one, it refers to being separated from normal use. In other words, it was a word used in a marriage covenant. One would say to the other, I sanctify myself from all others unto you only. Right? I give myself, I pledge my faith to you only, no one else. That's a covenant between you and that, your, your spouse to be at that moment and God. You're set apart. Holiness is separation 
from all others unto God. And as it is with husband and wife, holy is being separ is separated from all other as a man, from all other women unto my wife, and from all other men unto my husband. Holiness. The second one is it reveals oneself to the other. In other words, you continually reveal yourself to your spouse. How many in here are married? You, you, you uh, have learned more about your spouse after five years? For some of you have. The rest of you, we're going to pray for you. Because you're deceived. <laughs> you learn more about your spouse often. It's a regular part of the marriage. And you know what? It gets better and better. It gets better and better. So hang in there. It gets better and better. My wife and I would be married 35 years, right? I get right? 35 years. Cool. Say, so how did she put up with me for 35 years? I don't know. <laughs> all right, all right. That was not necessary. So it reveals oneself to the other. In other words, it refers to an ongoing, intimate, personal knowledge of the other one. And it takes place in marriage since the two become one. I'm looking at Josh and Lisa. Good to have you guys with us. Did your wedding three years ago? I did. Somewhere around. They've got another child on the way, too. Lord bless you. And as it takes place between a, a man and a wife, this is the this is same thing is true with the Godhead. In other words, God has been revealing himself to humanity, whom he created in his image and after his likeness. God continues to reveal himself to us. Aren't you glad? He does it. God has done it in creation. He has done it in his written word. He has done it in his personified word, Jesus Christ. God is a God who reveals himself, who makes himself known, always reaching out to humanity. Aren't you glad he reached out to us? For God so loved the world that he gave. He reached out because of his love. He did that. He's always reaching out. The love of God is an eternal love. Are you convinced today that God loves you? You have to be convinced. God loves you. And the nature of the one who makes himself known that nature is also love. And that's a, it's an eternal love, as we already said several times this morning. For God so loved you, loved the world. And this love of God is not the love of or for family or spouse. It isn't a friendship kind of love. It's what I read to begin the service with, 1 Corinthians 13. Put that meaning in this text. God's love is unconditional. God's love is an eternal decision. God decided to love you way back, way back. Before the foundations of the world, God made a decision to love you. And that decision to love you can't be revoked. Because why? God's righteous. God loves you and it is out of this love that God does what he does out of his eternal love God moves out to create all things especially humanity who is created in his image and in his likeness you need to get that point this morning God made an eternal decision to create you because he loves you You didn't just happen. You're not an accident. You're not a mistake. If you believe you're a mistake, then you don't believe the love of God. God loves you. He created you. And he didn't create you because he, he needed company. And 
neither did he create you just to create something. We, we know that. I look at myself. You could have made something a lot better looking than this. Thanks, Betty. I don't want to say about Betty here because she, 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 she argued with me. He created you because of his love, his eternal love, eternally existent and eternally expressed. And he created you with a calling upon your love. Love. We have that first, bring that love there, love. So in the beginning was the word. And before even the foundations of the world, they devised a plan for your redemption. Out of what? Out of love. That is the first thing. The first thing is love. I'm gonna, there's four things. I'm going to skip the second and the third and go to the fourth. The fourth one is grace. And then we're going to go backwards. This fits. Paul uses this phraseology. We're going to look at love, peace, mercy, and grace. We'll do it fast. Don't worry. Don't get all shook up if you're having a bad day. Paul uses this phraseology in many of his, his introductions. And, and note that the word grace is above the cross. And it is there because that's a crucif the crucifixion of Christ is the, is the apex of history, so to speak. Everything hinges around that. Isn't that neat? Everything hinges around the, the cross of Christ. And it's common for us to look We'll look back at the cross and consider that the cross or grace the beginning. It's not the beginning. That's an error. There are some who teach that mercy comes out of the cross or that peace comes out of the cross or that love comes out of the cross. That's not correct. Grace comes out of the cross. We'll get to that. Peter basically tried to, to make everything come out of that. Remember when Jesus went on the Mount of Transfiguration with Peter, James, and John? And he's talking to Elijah and Moses about what? Going to the cross. He's talking about that. And Peter, man, he gets all excited. And he said, let's stay right here. <laughs> I don't, haven't you been in that place where the presence of God has been so powerful you don't want to leave? Let's stay right here and let's build three tabernacles. Woo, hallelujah. We went, I don't want to leave this place. You know what? We can't do the work of God unless we leave this place. <laughs> you can stay up here all day. You're not getting anything done. We got to leave this place. And so Peter wanted to hang out. And you and I have a tendency to want to hang out at the cross and do the same thing. We have to keep our eyes in the right direction. And that's towards the eternal. That's towards the end. That's towards where God is calling us. We must move out from the cross and go onward. Grace is not a state of existency. If we think that grace is a state of existence, we will never move forward towards God's purpose and his calling on our life. Grace is always an action of God toward us. Get that. Grace is not an emotion, it's action. Grace is action. That's what it is. And it's God's action toward us. Why does God act toward you? Why does God save you? Why does God forgive you? Is it just for you? No, it's not just for you. If it is, then our focus is on self. And it's not on God. It makes us the source and not God the source. You see, we are the beneficiary. Aren't you glad? But God is acting out of himself for his own good pleasure. God doesn't move by his spirit when we gather together or any time, maybe in your own private worship. He doesn't move by his spirit upon you so you can get some emotional high or some spiritual lift or some personal tickle going on. God doesn't redeem us so we can continue looking back at the crucifixion in some mystical way. That's the wrong direction. So why does God act toward us? It's a good question. Why did God send his only begotten son? Well, the next one is mercy. Before grace had to be mercy. God's actions towards you come forth out of mercy. Mercy is an emotive feeling. It's emotion. It stands behind grace, which is God's actions. Mercy is not an action. 
Mercy speaks to the feeling that God possesses for lost humanity in our weakness. And you go right to uh, the, the death of Lazarus. When Jesus was there, and he, his mercy was, was there, he, he, what did he do? He, the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus, he wept. He showed emotion. That was mercy on Mary and, and, and Martha and everybody that was there. He had mercy. But I'm going to tell you what, that mercy did not bring Lazarus forth from the grave. It took grace to do that. Mercy. Mercy has to do with symptoms. And from an eternal perspective, God looks at lost mankind in our weakness. Paul said in Romans, when we were without strength and due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Mercy. It's like a parent who has a sick child. Any parent in here ever have a, a, a child who is sick? And they just laid limp. Right? When Aaron got sick, that's all you did to lay there. And there's nothing you could do, right? But did not your heart go out to them? Right? That man, that's mercy. That's mercy. But mercy alone will do nothing to help get rid of the pain. I could stand there and weep over a, a sick child from now until the cows come home, and they're still going to be in pain. Mercy doesn't alleviate the pain or the suffering. It doesn't do that. Grace does that. Grace is an action based on mercy. We have the grace of God today because of his mercy on our lost condition. He looked at humanity with mercy. And he moved in action. So standing behind grace, God's action is mercy. And standing behind mercy, God's emotion is peace. That's the second part, peace. Peace is not the absence of war as our world wants to tell us. That's not peace. Jesus is the giver of true peace. Jesus is the giver of real peace. Outside of Christ, there is no peace. The, the world can't, if the world could create it, they would have. They can't. Why can't they? Because outside of Christ, there is no peace. You can wear those peace shirts all day long. Peace ain't coming until Jesus comes again. He doesn't give the kind of peace that the world gives. The world gives a temporary truce in the middle of a war. Peace refers to being completely unified for a purpose. Peace. Again, the Godhead is unified. We talked about that. About the redemption and the salvation of mankind. God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit got together before the foundations of the world and decided to save you. They decided to redeem you from your sin. They were unified in that. And you and I cannot experience true peace until we become totally unified with God's purpose. We have to be totally unified with Him. Jesus did everything from a platform of peace. He came to do the will of the Father, didn't He? He didn't come to do His own will. He came to do the will of the Father. Matter of fact, he didn't do anything but what he saw his father doing. He didn't say anything but what he heard what his father was saying. And he didn't go anywhere but that he saw his father going that way. Oh, if we could get in line with that. Oh, boy, we, 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 that, that's where we need to get. And that's exactly how Jesus was able to face a temptation in the wilderness, how he was able to, to handle the Pharisees and the Sadducees. It was all on the platform of peace. Peace and what? Unified with the Godhead. Father, I'm going to do what you tell me to do. I'm going to go where you tell me to go, and I'm going to say what you want me to say. And if all of us can get on that platform of peace, oh, what a different life we would live. Right? Only doing. That means I've got to communicate, though. That means I've got to read his word. That means I've got to pray. But that's where he wants us to act from. He did it because he's one with the Godhead. And the same is true with us. Love. God's nature leads to peace, unity with God's purpose. Peace leads to mercy, an emotion towards lost humanity. Get this today. And mercy leads to grace, our action on behalf of lost humanity. You see where the gospel is going? If we don't have the love of God, we'll never have the peace of God. And if I don't have the peace of God, when I look at the lost, I'm just going to... 
I'm not going to have mercy on the lost. And if I don't have mercy on the lost, I'm not going to express any grace to them. That's the gospel. It's played out all through the scriptures. Grace is action. Mercy is emotion. Peace is unity with God's plan, his purpose, and his will. And love is God. And standing behind grace and standing behind mercy, standing behind peace, God's love. And God's love is a decision. He didn't have to love you. He chose to love you. God chose to love you from eternity. Think about that. And he has decided to love all of lost humanity from eternity. For God so loved. He not only loved you in your mother's womb, he loved you before the world were created. He loved you. That decision is fixed because it's an eternal decision. And not one person can change it. And those who reject the love of God will spend an eternity in hell, always thinking and always knowing about the love of God that they rejected. Love is why God created. Therefore, regardless of what anyone has ever told you, God loves you with an unconditional love. And that love cannot be altered by any action on anyone else's part or your part. You can't change how much God loves you. And I'm glad because in my ignorance and my enmity against God and my sinfulness, I would probably want to have changed that. I don't want that person to love me. Have you ever said that? I don't want that person to love me. Ugh. And we just said the same thing about God. God, I don't want you to love me. Sorry, Charlie. He loves you. And he loves you so much, he gave his only begotten son. Lastly, this morning, oh, it was kind of a long message. I knew it was going to be, but I had to get this out. As we come to the Lord's table, it's fitting to go to the Last Supper. And Jesus looked at the disciples, and he said this, If you love me, here we go again, <laughs> love. If you love me, what? Keep my commandments. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. So today, how do you view God? How are you viewing him? Because people have a warped concept of God. Picture yourself sitting across from Jesus that day, and he looks at you. And you make eye contact with him. And he says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. What would your response be? What would go on in your mind? What would you be thinking about? Take Peter. <laughs> Take the other ones, you know. What would you be thinking about? Now, a person who has guilt feelings would see Jesus crossing his arms and shake his head. You know? If you really loved me, you would have kept my commandments. How many times do you think God's looking at you that way? <laughs> what do you hear in his voice? And we, we, we sense that. He said, man, I'm, I'm going to live. I'm going to do better. I'm going to do better. He, he can't. None of us can live perfectly. Maybe some of you see Jesus sitting there saying, if, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. You see, raising his eyebrows at you. If you love me, you'll keep them. You'll keep them. Remember, I'm watching your every move. Right? I'm watching your every move. I don't have a pen. And I'm keeping track. Writing it down. Some of us see God with a, with a pen and a and paper, marking down everything we're doing. He's making a list and checking it twice. See who's naughty or nice. Some people view God that way. And if you view God that way, do you realize how hard it is to pray? If you're looking at a God like that? 
an inspector. He's inspecting every, your every move. And some of us think God's that way, so you know what we do? We inspect everybody else's move. Hey, I'm watching you down there in that second row. Ooh. A lot of us turn into inspectors, making big deals out of minor biblical issues. You know, it's hard to enjoy the fellowship of someone who's always scrutinizing everything you're doing. Then there are some who see God as distant. Hey, by the way, if you love me, you might want to think about doing a few of my commandments. Just saying. Cruising on along. They think God is distant, that he doesn't really care about their lives. God has, doesn't have time to talk to me. He has, he has to talk to somebody more important than me. I'm going to let you know that there's nobody in God's eyes more important than you. He created you because he loved you. Because he loved you, he died for you. There's no one more important than you. He's not far off in space somewhere. And there are many people who have experienced absentee parents. They were somewhere, but, but not caringly involved in their lives. And they see God as distant and, and uncaring about what we're going through and uncaring about a, a relationship with them. And that view negatively affects how we, how we think of God. It negatively affects the blessings that God wants to pour out upon us. You see, our view of God is vital. The last verse today, and we're going to end with this, is Romans 15, verse 7. Just in case you're wondering, it says this, Therefore, receive or accept one another just as Christ ex received us or accepted us to the glory of God. Accept each other just as Christ accepted you, then God will get the glory. So the question comes, who am I to accept? You mean, oh, Wes is gone. You mean, uh, you mean I got to accept Lisa? Really? Did God accept me? Then guess what? I don't have to accept Lisa. I get to accept Lisa. I choose to accept Lisa. He says, accept Elaine as I have accepted. Did God accept you when you were ugly? Did he accept you when you were sinful? Did he accept you when you were no good? And I am to esteem everyone else better than myself. So if God accepted me when I was the scum of the earth, I must accept you because you're the beauty of the earth. Right? Right. That's what he's saying here. So rather than a disappointing God or an inspecting God or a distant God or, 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 a, or a, God, a, a, a God with a ball bat, <laughs> right? You need to know that God is an accepting God today. He doesn't accept our sin. That has to be repented of. We have to do that. But his arms are always wide open. He is an accepting God. He is an accepting God because of his love for you. And because of his love for you, the gospel of Jesus Christ was designed from the foundations of the world with you in mind. <laughs> Hallelujah. I love it. He loves you this morning. And he has the power, the intrinsic ability to save you from your sin. Past, present, and future. And he has the power to get right into this inside of your life, the inside of the situation you're going through right now, and turn it around for his glory and your good, your eternal well-being. And as alone as you may feel at times in your life, you're never forgotten by God. Never. You and I were on his mind. We were within his heart. We were within his mind before the foundations of the world, for that's when the gospel of Jesus Christ was put forth. And if you have trusted Christ as your Savior, then your wages of sin are freely forgiven. If you haven't accepted Christ and trusted Him as your Savior, you're still carrying your sins.
He wants to forgive you today of your sins. Your heads bowed and your eyes closed as the musicians come, as our brethren prepare. As Dick and Henry and John, could you help us? And Anton, could you help us at the table this morning? If you, if you guys would come. 1 John 4, 9 and 10 says, God showed how much he loved us by sending his only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. That's real love. It's not that we love God, but that he loved us. The high price, the high price of your forgiveness was worth the sacrifice to God. Even when you were an enemy of God, think about this today, an enemy of God, separated and alone, he loved you. He saw your need. He identified with, the, with your pain of death and sacrificed himself for you. That's the true meaning of the gospel. And it is the power of God unto salvation to all who actively believe. Your heads bowed and your eyes are closed today. And if you've never trusted the Lord for salvation, or maybe you have and you've walked away from him, you're not, you know that you're not in the arms of the Savior, living within His will. And you want to correct that situation today. You want to say, Lord, forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me. Put me on that right path. I want to live for you with eternity in mind. Not today in mind, but eternity. If you want to do that today, either give your life to Christ or rededicate your life to the Lord, would you just raise your hand? Anyone today? Anyone? Paul tells us to examine ourselves before we come to the Lord's table. We serve an open communion. All you need is a right relationship with Christ. Lord, I, I thank you for your word today. As we come to your table, Lord, prepare us to receive. Knowing, Lord, that you are the host that belongs to you. You are serving us. May we receive what you have for us today. In Christ's name, amen. Go ahead and begin singing that song if you would. Oh, 
to be the name of the Lord. I'm so glad His love is amazing. I'm so glad He died for me. I'm glad He died for you. I'm glad He died for everybody outside this church, around this world, because there's hope in Christ. Paul said, I received from the Lord that which I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which He was betrayed, took bread. And when He had given thanks, He broke it, and He said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Has everyone been served? That needed to be served. We didn't miss anybody. Let's pray. Father, We've learned of your love today. It is unconditional. It cannot be revoked. We cannot do anything to change it. And Lord, it didn't begin at any one time. It's been from eternity. It always was. And it always will be. It's because of that love that you acted out towards us by grace through the cross of Jesus Christ. Lord, I thank you for those who have placed their faith in you. For you are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And so we thank you for the bread. And we thank you for the cup. And we give you praise. We give glory for who you are. And may, Lord, this, this love that you have for us, may it be active in our lives for each other and for the lost. But more importantly, that can't happen until it's right with you. Lord, may we love you because you first loved us. And may we love you with an unconditional love. May we give you all that we have and all that we are. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's eat of the bread together. Let's take the cup. Let's drink the cup together. Let's drink all of it to the glory of God. Hallelujah.
Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. All our hope is in you. All our hope is in you. All the glory to you, God. You're the light of this world. Sing that again. All our hope. All our hope. possible wasn't for his mercy for you for me which would have been possible if they weren't together on it which wouldn't be possible if they didn't love hallelujah I'm thankful for the love of God you know I'm thankful that he loves me blessed be his name blessed be his name thank you Lord Jesus stand this morning. This afternoon, right at 1.30, we have Edgewood. 2 o'clock at Edgewood. 2 o'clock. Those who are interested in ministering at Edgewood today and tonight are service at 6. And we're thankful for what the Lord has done. And I thank you for your love. Thank you for your faithfulness to the Lord. Isn't he good? Amen. Wayne, would you close our service in prayer this morning. Lord bless you. Have a tremendous day in the Lord.